All right, uh, it's Dr. Morton. Welcome to the Logic Design Lecture uh, 16. And it's for Friday, October the 2nd. Hard to believe. Uh, okay, and uh, so we're going to pick up where we left off in Unit 7. Uh, we had just talked about uh, sometimes you want to add a layer. It simplifies the logic, but it does increase the propagation delay. The example I gave um, uh, is... Uh, not the best. Um, yeah, I th I'm trying to think. Maybe that was. Yeah, anyway. Well, okay, anyway. Yeah, maybe the. Well, here. I don't know. Uh, let me. Okay, let me present this. I don't know why that was so confusing to me the other day. But anyway. Uh, so here's your original expression, AB plus AC plus AD plus CDE, and here's your resulting one. And actually, yeah, it does look like you've gone from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 gates to 1, 2, 3, 4 gates. Yeah. Why, do, why did I get that all mixed up? I don't know. But anyway, so sometimes we add a layer, we can simplify a gate, but you pay the price of your critical path now goes through 1, 2, 3 gates before you get an output, whereas here nothing goes through more than 2 layers, 2 gates. All right, anyway, so one of the things that, that we want to do, we want to talk about uh, the minimum solution of multiple output nets. Um, let me put my little face back up here. I'm going to shrink it down. Okay, so you know that uh, when, you do, uh, when you do a truth table, you can add multiple outputs. All you do when you do that is you just add an additional column, right? And so... Uh, in that regard, uh, we can definitely have multiple outputs, and um, and so what are what are some of the considerations? Well, one of the considerations is that you can share terms between the outputs. So if you're trying to get the minimum solution, sometimes you can save gates by using the output of the gate, not only just for for one OR gate generating one of the functions, but you can have multiple, uh, you can, you can, you might be able to route that same output to another OR gate and use that term again if it happens to show up in one of the other functions. So there, there are several different ways that can happen. Um, so let's look at that. Now here's some guidelines. Basically you could, you still plot a separate k-map for each of the outputs you want to generate and you look at the prime implicants. You look at the ones that are essential because they cover ones, uh, not just essential to the to the to say F1, but essential because uh, they cover ones that are not involved in any of the terms in F2. And uh, so let's look at an example. It's easier to look at it than it is to explain it. So you you, you do look at the shared ones, and sometimes you can uh, definitely save terms. Now you're going to have to use this when you do your uh, when you do your uh, group project. You're going to need to do this. So, um, yeah. All right, so let's give an example. So you have three functions here using the same independent variable. So your independent variables are A, B, C, D, and your three functions are F1, F2, F3. And here are the min terms for each of those functions. So we'll plot the three maps, and here they are. Th so these would be the optimum solutions for, that, for the functions individually. Now, one thing you would immediately notice, look at this. This would be uh, AB, right, for this, that would be the term, and this term would be uh, ACD. But here we have AB, and we have A prime CD, and here we have a term that uses both these two terms. So what we could do, we could generate AB and use it not only for this output, F1, but we could use it for F3, and then we could generate uh, ACD, for this output, we could generate A prime CD for this, and then we could use we could put both of those uh, terms into the output gate and generate this term here instead of having to generate a CD term. Uh, so rather than group these two, we would just group these as uh, as non prime implicants because we already have the these two here that we have to generate. So we might as well just reuse them for this, and then we would throw in this term. And that would give us the three outputs. So let's see what that looks like. So if you just write the original equations, uh, 
you would have, you could certainly share AB, but see this CD term here? You can generate this CD term by just putting in ACD and A prime CD, where the A will drop and you'll just have CD. So basically, you can save, uh, you can save one more gate by having the output gate for this be ABC prime plus ACD plus A prime CD. So it, it, it decreases the number of gates by one and only increases the number of inputs to the output gate for F2 by one input. So that's, that's probably a good trade-off. So we can actually get by with uh, one, two, three, four gates plus the output gates, five, six, seven. So, so that's definitely one way to think about that. Okay, um, and when you do your project, you're gonna, need to, you're gonna need to look at your outputs. A lot of you have seven segment displays. You have seven, uh, seven functions from the same truth table, and you need to share terms between those functions to get down to your target number of gates. Okay, and of course we can not only do this with SOP with with our min, you know, with well with an SOP form, but we can also do it with POS forms as well. Okay, um, so for multiple outputs, the best solution may not be the one with the most shared terms. Uh, it it might be one uh, where you use terms between functions. All right. Um, okay, that finishes seven. And so I'm going to stop this for a second. Let me just pause. Okay, so um, unit eight. So uh, what we'll do here then, we're going to uh, dive into it. So first, let me just say something about your group projects. I'd like you to, I like, so the groups are pretty well settled, uh, and I'd like you to all be working on your truth tables. And I'd like you to try and get that done by the end of today. So certainly by Monday, uh, I'd like you to have that done. And what I'd like, what I, what would really be nice is if uh, a representative from each of your teams could come to my office hours on Monday and just give me a little quick, you know, 15 second uh, confirmation that you've been able to get your team together on Zoom or however. And, uh, and that you have been able to uh, talk about your project and, you, you're, you, and you've got your truth table sort of mostly worked out. Uh, so that would, be, that would be really great to hear. Um, so let's try and do that. And I'll send out an email to that effect. Um, uh, yeah, logic design. Um, Yeah, office hours. So let me let me just. I don't want to waste the time here. Let me just do this. So, uh, so let me. So yes. So let me just talk uh, again. So uh, I'd like each group to select a member <clears throat> and send uh, and send to the Zoom office hours on Monday at twelve, uh, and just give me a uh, like a fifteen second verbal report. And then by Monday at midnight, I'd like your team to submit. Uh, uh, your group to submit their truth table okay so we'll see hopefully you can do that and if you're really having trouble let me know we'll work on it but um okay and here's what the pre the final presentation when you get it all done this is what it should look like uh you should introduce each member of your group and your group number describe your project and your project number turn in your truth table describe how you created it uh from the problem talk about any problems you had in developing the truth table and then uh basically just describe kind of how you're going to finish up the project. So that's kind of that 15 second presentation I'd like on Monday. And, uh, and um, you know, and, and how you're maybe anything about how you're dividing your, your um, division of labor a little bit. Um, so just, just whatever. Uh, this is not, these aren't hard. Just give me sort of an informal, you know, cover most of this stuff if you can. And turn in a truth table uh, and I'll create a link on Blackboard for you to turn it in. I'd like you to upload it as a Word document. That'd be best. Uh, okay, so uh, well, a couple, a couple, a couple of other gates. Uh, these are kind of interesting. Uh, they haven't, uh, in my view, they haven't gotten a lot of play over the years. But uh, that might change as we, as we might have to. You know, who knows? We may be moving to slightly different technologies 
and uh, some of these things may actually become more important. It's hard to say. But in any event, uh, so we have what's called a majority and minority gate. And if you have uh, in the majority gate, so if you have uh, the majority of the inputs are a 1, then your output is a 1. So here, two ones is a 1, uh, three ones is a 1, and so forth. And the minority gate is just the inverse of that. Okay? So two more gates. And that you can you can read this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this one group, this is uh, this article was from a number of years ago now. But uh, they looked at, they presented a methodology methodology for using efficient majority minority network uh, networks and basically showed that uh, for some of the the quantum cellular automata uh, using this uh, QCA or single tunneling single electron tunneling SET and tunneling phase logic TPL that they're actually uh, more efficient uh, using majority minority gates maybe uh, up to 68 percent reduction in gate counts possible when use, utilizing majority minority gates uh, compared to the the, the standard uh, you know the standard gates like NAN, 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 NOR, NOR or SOP, POS. Um, so that's kind of interesting and a little bit crazy. Okay, um, so in Unit 8, we're gonna we're gonna kind of do a a review of combinational design, and um, we're going to uh, look at uh, limited fan in, limited fan out. We're gonna talk about gate delay and timing considerations and hazards. And then we'll briefly mention simulation and testing and logic cells. We probably won't get through all that uh, t today. Uh, what I am going to do for the lecture for Monday, I'm just going to post uh, the lecture I did where I worked through the exam. At least that's that's what I'm thinking now. We'll see. All right. Um, I might add a little piece to that. Maybe we'll see. All right. So, um, so let's do it. So here's a good summary. Uh, in uh, uh, chapter 8.1, and this is good to review that. Uh, so you basically set up your truth table. If you have n independent variables, you're going to have 2 to the n rows in your truth table. You may have one output function, or you may have several output functions. Each one of, the, each one of those gets a, a column for the dependent variable, but it doesn't add rows to the truth table. So and then you identify any of your non-occurring inputs, and they can be don't cares for the outputs. So you will be able to select the output for whatever you want it to be, since those inputs would never occur. Um, then what you can do is you can uh, generate the SOP or uh, the min term and the max term solution and simplify it. Now we've looked at several different ways. If you don't have that many variables, then KMAPs are a really good option. Um, and the other thing is we can do then we can we can just then uh, for any hardware constraints. Maybe your gates can only drive, maybe your gates only have three inputs, maybe, you know, maybe you, and you might need a four input gate, so then, then you might have to deal with that. So, okay. And so then, uh, uh, and then once you make all the adjust adjustments for, uh, let's say you need NAN NAN, so you adjust it for NAN NAN, uh, you adjust it for two input gates, uh, and then uh, maybe you even uh, maybe you even uh, maybe even look at the possibility of it expanding to three levels in some of the cases, and then finally uh, you uh, look at your multiple outputs and see if you can save some gates by sharing outputs if you have several outputs by sharing terms. Okay, so our two level networks. So now this should become uh, this should be very familiar to you. There are two canonical networks are uh, with two layers is our SOP, which basically is and or. And then we can use De Morgan's laws, double invert it, and partially expand that and get nan nan or nan or nor or. Now I don't care that you memorize all this, but I would like you to know that nan nan comes from SOP form and nor nor comes from the POS form. I think that's think that's a good thing to just know. Uh, but the other two forms, you can figure those out or look them up, but that's no big deal. But I'd like you to know that NAN, NAN, and NORNOR. And NAN, NAN, and NORNOR are very, very, uh, very popular forms. So uh, I think that's just a good thing to do. Okay. Um, 
So limited fan in. So sometimes, well, there is a practical limit. So a, a gate with you know 50 inputs is not practical uh, because it uh, there's all sorts of parasitic capacitances and, and inductances, and it's going to really change the function. And uh, it's not going to behave like some of the other gates with two or three inputs. Uh, so, uh, so it's just one of those deals where you probably don't want to have gates that size. So you, then you do have to add layers, and that, that can be a problem. Or you need to revisit your logic. But in any event, uh, you have to modify the design to fit in. And normally what that means then is expanding. Uh, usually you have to add a layer. So how can we do that? How, what if we need uh, uh, four inputs for an AND gate, but we only have three input AND gates? Well, it's actually not too complicated. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, well, let me, I'm going to switch this out and I'm going to draw. So let me uh, expand this and I'll change cameras and uh, we'll do this one. Okay, so so basically here, uh, what I want to talk about, let's, let's say we have, let's say we have uh, an AND gate here. Uh, well, so we only have, let's say we have a four input NAND gate and we, and we want to we want to but but this is what we need but we don't have it so how do we get that well all we need to do is do two two input NAND gates and then we can have a third one and bring that in and that these are these then are equivalent and that same same thing is true for OR gates but what you have to be careful about is, and you have to keep this in mind, you have to remember that for NAND gates, if we put a little bubble on here, this is not true. We actually have to put an inverter in between. We have to invert these inputs. So that being the case, um, we, if we're just going to use NAND gates for this, we can use a NAND gate for an inverter. To make a two input NAND gate into an inverter, all you have to do is tie them together, and this equals an inverter. So we can, so we, all we have to do is put one of these in between here, and we can take off this bubble. So with NAND gates, this would look like And this then would be equivalent to if we had now now these are equivalent okay so remember that and that's and the exact same through is it the exact same thing is true with NOR gates with standard NOR gates uh, with the standard NOR gate, well, sorry, with OR gates, this is how we would do. Um, so regular OR gates, that works great, but when you make them NOR gates, then you have to go to this, this kind of construct over here. All right, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, let me switch back to me. Okay. Okay, so, um, all right, so we're rocking along here. Uh, so, delay and timing diagrams. Okay, first let me just talk about timing diagrams. We've, we've, we, we've, uh, we, we haven't really dealt with these yet, but they're an important part of uh, pretty much any, uh, any circuit. Uh, you will see these diagrams in almost all the data sheets. Um, 
if I if I bring up say a data sheet let me let me do this let me let me bring up a data sheet for uh, let's say um, um, let's see so let's do a 74 um, 7410 I don't even know yeah let's see so there's a NAND gate data sheet 7410 NAND gate data sheet and national semiconductor oh no so we need I hate it when it okay let's do that uh, yeah well it doesn't really matter okay we'll just pick it something golly sorry I should have probably pre-done this okay so here's here's the data sheet now so if you just scroll down I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this I just what I want you to see is we'll eventually get down here ah look at that here's our wave form and test circuit you will find these in almost every single uh, data sheet and sometimes lots and lots of them and uh, yeah so anyway okay so that's what I wanted to show you okay now so here's our here's our little example I, I tried to draw it didn't do such a good job uh, but this is an inverter and and here's here's our data sheet or uh, you know the timing diagram from our data sheet okay so the timing diagram from our data sheet shows the input X and the output X prime here now the first thing is these diagrams are not to scale uh, generally as you saw in, in the example I just showed you they have labels all over them and you have to look at a table and look up the labels to make sense out of it that's generally how it goes so uh, in this case the input X goes from 0 to 1 now notice we don't we don't even label these things it's just you just assumed that this is high voltage and that's low voltage and whatever voltage your parts are running at some low volt parts may be at 3.3 or 1.8 some uh, others may be at 5 volts you have to look in the data sheet but uh, but uh, if we're running at uh, say in this case if we're running at uh, 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 say 5 volts then this would represent 5 volts and this would be 0 volts now so here X goes from 0 to 5 and before but it takes this amount of time before the output goes from 5 to 0 because remember the output's going to be x prime so um, okay so then we would go and we'd look up and we would see e1 and typically the things kind of things we'd see we would see a uh, typical time and then we might see a maximum so the so the manufacturer's guaranteeing uh, it'll never be more then a maximum say of a uh, of five nanoseconds uh, but so they're guaranteeing that and uh, but so there might be some uh, you know some um, what's the right term uh, I'm thinking of there might be some uh, uh, max there, there but there's still a typical so the average part might be say it at, at uh, 15 nanoseconds but the maximum guaranteed might be say 35 nanoseconds and you see this all the time the other thing that's really interesting is uh, for the notice here the input X goes from say 5 volts down to 0 and here you see the output coming up from 0 to 5 again X and X prime so obviously the output should be the opposite of the input so if the input 0 the output should go to 5 volts well what's interesting is uh, if you looked up in the table you you would almost always see that that e1 probably is not equal to e2 they're 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 often different and maybe even very different this might be this rise time might be 10 nanoseconds and the fall time might be 20 uh, for typical and the guaranteed maximum might be 35 for both or something so so you're never really sure just what you're going to get uh, in that regard uh, so it's kind of interesting 
But in any event, um, so this, these, are, these timing diagrams are used extensively. And uh, they're generally, it's generally to give you sort of a mental picture, but you don't make, you typically don't take measurements off of them. Now, sometimes the time axis will be calibrated, but, uh, and I'm going to do that on, on, on the next test probably, but, uh, but it won't, but it's a little different than, uh, most of the time they're just notional. And, you, and mostly we have labels on them, and then you look up labels in the table, and that, that tells you then what, how things work. Okay, uh, here's another one. This is professionally drawn. I ripped this off from someplace. Uh, and the uh, here we have the input and a clock. Now, when the clock edge hits, and the clock's very fast, so we're just showing this as a sharp edge, uh, our input has to be set up and good for some T setup time before the edge, and it has to stay good for some T hold time after the edge in order for it to be guaranteed to be properly locked in to wherever it's getting locked in. We'll come. We'll talk about this more in time. So we have a setup, a data setup time, and a data hold time. And and so when you're designing these things, you have to make sure that uh, that your signals are going to com comply with these these things. And now, if you make your clock slow then usually you have no problems. But it's when you're really pushing the limits, trying to run your clock as fast as possible, that you have to look at these things very carefully. And and uh, sometimes you even, uh, where you have maximums and minimums, you might even, uh, you you might exceed the time for the maximum, but the typical you might design to, but then some of your parts aren't going to work because you're going to have, you're going to going to have some that'll be all, you know, be as long as the maximum guaranteed. So there's a lot of considerations. Um, so our, so our all of our combinational networks have in, have built-in timing issues. There there are delays when you go through a gate, and uh, and as you get uh, more and more into designing real things, uh, you'll find you have to pay a fair amount of attention to this because uh, obviously most of the time your product's competing to be fast uh, so that uh, people want to use your product and not somebody else's that isn't as fast. Some of these time considerations result in what we call hazards. And uh, sometimes we can use, use the hazards because it can give us a pulse shaping circuit, but sometimes there are glitches and can cause a problem. Uh, so some of the terms we like to use is gate delay, the time for a change at the input to cause a change at the output. Minimum delay versus typical nominal delay versus maximum delay. And a careful designers are going to design for the worst case. Then we have uh, rise time. That's time for an output to go from low to high. Fall time, time for the output to go from high to low. These may not be the same uh, on, this, on, on, this, on even just one gate. So on that very same gate, the rise time may be different than the fall time, which I had mentioned before on the inverter. Okay. So... Now we're getting, we're getting close to where we're going to start thinking and talking about sequential logic. And pretty soon, once we finish with flip-flops, uh, we'll have our next test and we'll be into the next, uh, into the, next uh, uh, the final division of the course, which is sequential design. Um, okay, but let's talk about hazards. So, uh, so we have, we have uh, two hazards we want to talk about here a static hazard and a dyna dynamic hazard. Now, probably the one that comes up more is the static hazard, uh, but we can have either one. A static hazard is when your output should stay the same, a one or a zero, but because of the way you did the logic, uh, there can be a small glitch down or up that's not supposed to be there, and then and then after a few nanoseconds, it's, it's back to where it was supposed to stay and everything's fine. Now that's, that's okay depending on your downstream logic. But if your downstream logic is, uh, uh, is, a, is, has, is sensitive to very short pulses, then this could cause a problem. Let's say, let's say you're designing a, uh, a system to launch ballistic missiles. Uh, and you... Uh, you don't carefully look at the hazards, your downstream system is an electronic response. So if it sees a 
10 nanosecond pulse from low to high that's not supposed to be there, it could launch a missile. Well, that would be very bad, uh, especially if it started, you know, World War III or whatever. So, so in that kind of a circuit, you'd want to be very, you'd want to be very careful to eliminate these kind of hazards. Now, let's say you're you're doing another circuit where all it's going to do is ring a bell in a school, and uh, and the bell's a mechanical bell, and uh, if you send a 10 nanosecond pulse to a mechanical bell, what do you think happens? Absolutely nothing. Because a mechanical bell can't, you know, can't wake up and have coffee and be ready to start ringing, uh, it probably takes something like, uh, you know, probably 80 or 90 milliseconds for it to to, to do that, much less say 10 nanoseconds. So, uh, so if your downstream logic is a bell, a mechanical bell, who cares? Uh, let that 10 nanosecond pulse just come on through; it'll be ignored at the other end. So. For that reason, you sort of have to know if you're going to deal with hazards, what their likely impact might be, and whether or not you have to fix them, or whether you can live with them. All right, let's look. So here's a static one hazard. Should be at level one, but oops, it does this little 10 nano, uh, 10 nanosecond blip, or maybe it's one microsecond. Or static zero should stay at zero, but it pops up to level one for just a short time and then back down. Now a dynamic hazard is where it's it's going to transition from low to high but it it has a sort of a little premature transition here and then it finally transitions and so just depending on how the logic is hooked up you can get these different effects and so uh, so here's a level one a dynamic and here and and we don't really talk about different dynamic hazards that we kind of lump them together all right so what do we do about hazards well here's an example of how you can get uh, a, a static one hazard where it's supposed to stay at one. Now here's our output F and we have inputs A, B and then out of this gate here we have an input G or sorry an output G that becomes an input into our final OR gate and then we have an output D or that comes out of this AND gate that goes in. Now if either G or D are one our, our, our F will be one but these gates let's say these gates have, including this inverter have a 10 nanosecond delay, okay? So let's say we're in a status where A equals one and <clears throat> C equals one and B equals uh, one, okay? So B is one here, but it's zero under this gate, so G is zero, but since C is one and B is one, D is a one. So the one, the G going in as a zero and the D going in as a one causes F to be a one. All right. Now, what happens when B changes? Maybe I'll maybe I'll draw on this so you guys can actually see this. Okay. So let's say B equals one, A equals one, C equals one. So on this gate you have a one right there, but here you have a zero coming out of the inverter. So G is zero but D is one. So with a zero going in here and a one going in there, you get a one out. Now let's say this changes and B goes to a zero. Does this instantly become one? No, it doesn't. It takes 10 nanoseconds. But what happens down here? Yes, this instantly goes to zero. So 10 nanoseconds later, this goes to one, but 10 nanoseconds later, this D goes to zero. This is still a zero, so now 10 nanoseconds after that, F becomes a zero. But at that time, G becomes a one, so 10 nanoseconds later, F goes back to one. So that gives us this little 10 nanosecond pulse here. And if, the, if your missiles were set to launch on a low, uh, all of a sudden you might have started World War III. But if you're just ringing a school bell, no problem, right? Uh, so, uh, so this is where you have to use some, you know, think about the downstream effect. Uh, so how do you fix this? Let me erase the ink here. Uh, or erase. Okay. So here's how you do it. And this, this, this is going to sound uh, familiar. So 
if we look at this, where's our solution? Well, you guys should be getting really good with uh, truth tables now. So you should know that you're going to want to circle. Oh, I got it. Never mind. Yeah, I got that. And that. And this. Now, you, now, what kind of term is the green one? The green one is a consensus term, right? So since the green one is a consensus term, um, then we, uh, we know that we don't really have to have it. But our actual hazard, interestingly enough, our actual hazard comes when we move from uh, B is when, when, we're, when we start down here and we go up to here when B changes to zero. Now, normally that shouldn't matter, right? We should still have an output of, we should, our output should still be one. F should be one. But it turns out if we have a slow inverter, we could have a glitch on F. So how would we fix that? All we have to do to fix that is to add our green consensus term there. And when we do that, now our consensus term, which is going to be uh, which is going to be uh, a uh, a yeah a c our consensus term is a c over here. That term will be one when we're down here, and that term will be one when we're up here. That term will never change. So if we look at the, if we add this AC term here, it's going to make it's going to be a one, regardless of what B is. So that's going to prevent F from glitching when the, when this is still zero and this goes to zero when it used to be one. This will hold us over, if you will. So what we learn from this is most of the time we can fix our consent our, our hazards by adding in a consensus term. Pretty cool, huh? So. Um, and let me let me erase the ink here too. Okay. So because that's pretty cool, um, so a lot of times we we really have to keep in mind just how uh, how important that is, and how uh, how you have to think about a lot of different things. And hazards are definitely something that come come up. Now it's not always the case that we would have a hazard in that situation. Um, we might not at all. We could, we might not have a hazard. We might just have a, uh, 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 well, it, 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 we, we could often have B and B prime both coming from, uh, from say, a, a flip-flop, and so uh, they would both change simultaneously, and we wouldn't have to put B through an inverter. So that would, that would basically prevent that problem uh, from coming up. But if it does come up, then you need to be aware of it and be able, and, and be prepared to correct it with, uh, in many cases, adding a consensus term. Okay, uh, simulation and testing. So these days, uh, everything is simulated and tested to the nth degree. And uh, the reason for a lot of that is that we, uh, let's see, so today we just really uh, we 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 do extensive testing, and the really nice thing is because almost all digital hardware is generated using hardware description languages, mostly Verilog in the United States. Uh, we we simulate it in software with our hardware description language, and um, and part of the reason for this is the the tremendous expense that goes into manufacturing integrated circuits. Uh, once you get it all set up, then you can you can uh, produce uh, quite a few circuits all at once on a on a big wafer. On a big wafer, you can make hundreds of circuits. Um, so uh, the 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 really nice thing is that uh, that this gives us very cheap parts, but the cost of a mistake is really high. Uh, and so, so you want to simulate things extensively so that when you actually go to produce it in the foundry, you know it's going to work. Uh, so we, and, and the tools that use this are, are almost exclusively hardware description language based tools. Okay, uh, 
in as part of this, we, we talk about four le levels of logic in our simulations. And uh, in HD in VHDL, we, we use uh, we have a IEEE standard of nine values, of which we really only use five. In Verilog, we really only have four. So the the five that we use uh, commonly in VHDL, and we pretty much ignore the others, the other three, are the uninitialized, unknown, logic false or zero, logic true or one, and disconnected or high Z state. All right, in in the very log world, we don't have the U, we don't have the uninitialized. We, if we're dealing with a register, our un uninitialized value is unknown. And if we're dealing with a wire, then our uninitialized value is uh, disconnected. At least in Verilog, that's how that works. Um, so they're the first five values for VHDL. And we often do these uh, four value logic truth tables. So believe it or not, uh, you can, in, even with the possibility of disconnected and, and unknown, you can still, in some cases, know exactly what the output's going to be. Because, uh, for instance, in an OR gate, if your one input is a one, doesn't matter that uh, these others, oh, that should be a, yeah, no, uh, that like it doesn't matter that the other inputs disconnected or unknown. You still know it's going to, if, if the one input is a one, you're going to have a one. So, uh, or in an AND gate, if you have a zero, you know that it doesn't matter what the other input is. It can be disconnected, unknown. It can be zero or one. You're still going to have a zero for an output. So we do, we have, and the simulators have truth tables like this with all four values uh, uh, worked out for, you know, all the various uh, primitives and logic gates. Test pattern generation. This is really another really interesting topic. Uh, there are whole books written about this. Um, most of the time in our logic devices, there, there, uh, the, the number of test patterns it would take to exhaustively test them uh, approaches infinity. In addition to that, uh, we may not have access to impose all these test patterns on our, on our device. We may only have access to a few inputs. Uh, and in that case, we're severely limited in what we can, what we can do. Uh, often these are state machines, and, and we have to step through a bunch of states to get to the state we want to test, and then we have to get the inputs all set correctly. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that's been done. Uh, but it's very difficult to, to exhaustively test anything. So uh, a lot of times what we're trying to do then is to come up with a good representative test. And, uh, and there's lots of rules and guidelines for this, which are way beyond the scope of this course. Um, so, but picking that, uh, that good combination of test patterns is, is uh, really a critical skill. All right, that pretty much concludes uh, Unit 8. So we're going to stop here, and we will, uh, uh, let's see, I think I'll expand this. So, uh, and we'll, uh, on Monday, uh, my current plan is to, is to post a video that shows you how to, how to, how to, how to work the, all the problems on the test. Um, so uh, we'll do that. Um, and everybody have a good weekend, and we will uh, see you on Monday.